Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you have given us this opportunity this morning to come together to uh, share in taking the bread and the wine in remembrance of you. And thank you for allowing us to praise you through song. And Father, we pray that uh, we would be just actively listening and seeing what we can learn from your word as Pastor Jason teaches today. You know, as we see around us, this world is always changing based on feelings and just uh, sometimes it seems like just whims at times as well. And your word does not change. Your word is always solid and we can always depend on that. And the only thing that should change is our opinion of you, the amount of awe that we have of you as we learn more and more about you and how, how you as our creator are just so far beyond us yet you have you have saved us you've allowed christians to understand what you have done for us and we should live accordingly and we pray that um, again as we praise you as we listen to your word that it would help us to grow help us to uh, continue to understand how we should respect you and follow you so father uh, we thank you for this time and pray and pray that you would be glorified and in all these things we pray in jesus name Amen. Amen. Thank you, Stephen. Well, grab your sword this morning and turn to the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 2. And we return to Mark where we were last week to what feels like the rushed gospel. I don't know if it feels rushed in the slowness of the preaching, (laughs) but it's the hurried gospel. It's get to the cross as fast as you can. And there are many characters, individuals to meet along the way. And we will meet another one this morning as the Lord continues his ministry and his healing ministry especially here at the beginning of the gospel. And we come to what is, I think, one of the most famous stories in the gospel. I think probably everybody in here is familiar with it. Even if you don't feel you're familiar with the gospels in general, you probably know the story of the paralytic. And so I want to jump right in, and I want to look at four parts of the story. We're going to look at the preacher, and then we're going to look at the paralytic himself, and then the pronouncement, and then the proof, the proof of the healing. So let's jump in here to number one, the preacher is interrupted. That doesn't usually happen to preachers today. Uh, and Pastors, we talk about how when we do counseling, we're interrupted. But it doesn't usually happen when you preach a message, and we're thankful for that. Um, But here, on this day, the preacher is interrupted. So let's look at the first two verses. Verse 1, And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. Chapter 2, verse 1. I may actually go through verse 4 here. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Pretty simple narrative. Capernaum now, though, if you notice there, verse 1, we return there again. Jesus returns to Capernaum. It is HQ. It is headquarters for Jesus. Uh, Yes, he had nowhere to lay his head, uh, but he also did find places that he would take residence in for some time and minister to all the towns around that one area. And Capernaum right now is his new home and really the launch point for his current ministry. And after being away from some days, remember, he he had to literally get away. The crowds were pressing in on him. Uh, He went to a desolate place. Um, And again, he had to move from town to town. Well, he returns to home. He returns to Capernaum. And he returns home after the crowds have settled. 
and he returns home unnoticed, at least at first, right? Jesus comes home, but Mark says, notice, it was reported that he was at home. I don't know if you have a lot of good friends in your life, if you come home and they all find out you're home and they all come to your house to see you. Well, I'm not sure all these were friends, but people wanted to see Jesus. The word got out, and notice it says many were gathered together. I don't think that sounds like a lot, but I think there was a lot of people again. And it says, so that there was no more room, not even at the door. The truth here, the reality is, Jesus has lost his privacy in solitude. Now, we have been experiencing solitude probably like we've never experienced in our life. Jesus, on the other hand, is in the very opposite position. Everyone in the city wants his attention. And he's not going to have a lot of solitude uh, all the way through his ministry till the end and to his death, although he will try again and again to get away. It kind of reminded me here of just the fact that, that so many people were with Jesus wanting to see him. Uh, I worked for a couple of very busy restaurants in Los Angeles at the end of college and then in graduate school. Um, there were lines for breakfast. They were that popular of a restaurant. And I waited on a number of celebrities over the four or five years that I did that, uh, actors, athletes, because uh, a lot of them live in that area where I was, including one famous actor, I remember, who would call in uh, in the evening before coming to this restaurant, and he wanted a quiet place where nobody would notice him. Uh, because this man was not used to just eating dinner by himself. And uh, apparently he became very so famous in the 90s that eventually he hated being noticed. He didn't like people coming up to him and, and talking to him and asking for his autographs and things like that. Um, so I remember bringing uh, one of these actors dinner that night, and I refrained from asking him anything that I wanted to ask him. He had a quiet place. Not all actors, actresses, and famous people eventually enjoy being noticed. Uh, they don't always enjoy the crowds of people gathering to them. They, they often hide away when they can. They try to secretly get into some place and not be noticed. And although they may have liked the spotlight at first, they often don't enjoy it later. And it becomes uh, a, a, a stressful life for them. Imagine Jesus, though. He, he's not an actor, an athlete, or musician. Uh, he doesn't just perform on a stage or on the movie screen. He actually heals people. He does something, he can do something for you or for your family member or for your friend that would radically change their entire life. And they, it's not just money issue, it's literally they could, he could save your life. Um, imagine the crowds that not only have the interest in Jesus, but have become aggressive because now it's not just a celebrity issue. It is they want something from him. And they know he can do something. The stories have got out. The word has got out what he can do. We just looked at the leper. Uh, as I said last time, this is like the only thing in comparison to healing a leper is raising the dead. And Jesus can do that. So you can imagine now it's just intensified. The crowds uh, are, are pressing in. Even here, there's not even any room at the door, and people are doing whatever they can to see him. The word, the word got out, and when they came to him, notice here, verse 2, he was preaching the word to them. I don't know if that's what they wanted, but that's what they needed, right? Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ, Paul says in Romans ten seventeen. I was recently asked... Uh, by a friend if we celebrate Halloween? My answer was no, we don't celebrate it. We don't really do much, except we do one thing. We do pass out candy and we give out gospel tracts. Because why? Because everybody in town is coming to your door. And I always tell people, seize the opportunity if you have a hundred people coming to your front door, unless your conscience is guilty in, in giving them something, seize the opportunity to... Spread the gospel news. And so that's what we do. We give the gospel to them. And we pray for them. Why not give them the greatest treat uh, that 
can be given them the source of goodness and eternal life. There's no trick with Christ. It's true. He is true. He is the source of eternal life. Uh, And that's what we encourage our kids, to be praying for those people. And so, in a sense, that's how we are involved in Halloween, even though we don't necessarily do everything. But look here, we have the same issue. Everybody is coming to this house. It might be Simon, Simon's mother-in-law's house, uh, probably just where Jesus is known to be staying. And the crowds are there, pressing in again and listening to the preacher. And Jesus seizes this opportunity again. As it says, he was preaching the word to them. Mark calls it the word. I think we often call it the word in our day as well. It is the gospel. He is preaching the Word of God. He is preaching the good news that is revealed from God that is about God. That's the good news. The good news really isn't so much about us. It's about God Himself is good and has provided salvation for a man. You could say the Gospel is really about God in the end. And so Jesus is faithful to continue preaching this. This is His mission. The gospel message is one concerning the person and work of Jesus who, as we're going to see here specifically, forgives sins. But the preacher, unlike preachers in the 21st century today, is interrupted by a group of five men. And it's interesting here, Mark is paralleling an earlier account where we had the demon-possessed man in the synagogue who did what? He interrupted Jesus, it seems, while Jesus was there. Both accounts happen in Capernaum. Both Jesus is teaching. Both he's interrupted. Both, as we're going to see, have the scribes present in that particular miracle. And of course, both are divine miracles that occur, resulting in the crowds being in awe of Jesus. But this time, he's not interrupted by one man. He's interrupted by Five men who want to see Jesus. Well, that's the preacher is interrupted. Secondly, next in our story is the paralytic is unhindered. The paralytic is unhindered. And I just read here, I'll read it again, verse 3. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. So we've seen, remember, a determined leper willing to ruin his reputation, willing to break the Mosaic law to get to Jesus, even to to contaminate uh, Jesus himself by getting too close. This time we see the same energy from a paralytic, even though he can't move. We see an amazing amount of energy. An unhindered man. And and this is a little bit different. This man is not outside the community like the leper. He's inside the community, but he is hindered and prevented. He lives a restricted life, probably very dependent upon other people in his life. And people would call him a sinner. Because those are sinners, right? The sinners are those who have illnesses and diseases and the outcasts of society. At least that's how the people then would view him as well as tax collectors and prostitutes. They're all sinners. But we have to understand the culture again, trying to kind of think in their shoes. Those who had illnesses or some kind of physical condition, maybe they were born deaf or mute uh, or like this man, uh, maybe he was born uh, without the ability to walk, they would view them as sinners that God is punishing them, that that the consequences uh, for their sinfulness have just come upon them. And then they're looked down on as second-class citizens. That's just the way it was back then. It seems strange to us. I don't think much of our culture thinks that way, at least. But that's how they viewed it. And so you were literally the riffraff of society, the outcasts, the nobodies, the second-class citizens. But understand, in order to be healed physically... You had to be restored spiritually to God. That's how they viewed it. They did not just see a physical condition. They saw a spiritual condition. 
you were a sinner. That's why you're in the physical condition you're in, whether you were born with that or something happened to you. You have not been, you are not right with God, and that's, you're, you're living out those consequences. The rabbis were quoted to have said this, there is no sick man healed of his sickness until all his sins have been forgiven him. That was the common quote back then that a lot of the rabbis would say. You can't be healed of your sickness until you have your sins dealt with. David Garland writes this, Most assumed that reconciliation with God must occur before healing would come. So again, this is how they saw things. Now, there's no doubt this man is coming to Jesus to walk again. I I assume that's probably one of his desires Uh, But I actually believe he's coming to Jesus to be restored to God, to be forgiven. I I don't think this is just a physical issue for him. I think there is a a spiritual reality here, uh, an awareness that he has of his own sinfulness. Again, because physical healing, according to Jews then, would never take place if your relationship with God was not right. He must find reconciliation with God. It is his greatest priority and possibly the only way to physical restoration, at least he thought. Spiritual restoration before physical restoration. Could the preacher do all of this? Well, maybe he can heal physically. He's done that already, but can he do more than that? Can he take care of my spiritual issue before God? Now, We don't know a lot about this man. Some think that he was paralyzed because he was in sin. He was doing something. He was out of God's will. And he maybe he had an accident. Um, I can think of a couple of people that I've known in my life that that I was aware of that they were professing Christians that were very clearly out of the will of God, living a life contrary to Christ. And the two that I think of both passed away. I don't know if, if God was sparing them. Uh, from going further. I don't know if... But this could be the case for him. He may have been breaking the Mosaic Law and as a result, as a consequence, he was paralyzed. But it would be a blessing, wouldn't it? As we're going to see. As we know the story. And four men bring him to Jesus here. There is, though, no access to Jesus. The room is full. Windows back then were very small, smaller than this. The door is blocked. There's no way to get in there. There's no way to see him. You must get in line to hear the preacher and to experience the possibility that he's going to heal you if he has time for you. Maybe you've tried to meet a famous preacher of some kind and there's a long line and you just don't know. By the time you get there, he's done and he's going to go in the back room and You don't have your opportunity. What would you do at this point? You need spiritual restoration. And maybe you greatly desire physical healing. And you need to get to him before he's done because once he's done preaching, what's going to happen? Everybody's going to want to talk to him. And you may lose your opportunity. We see again, as we saw with the leper, a desperation. I mean, shouldn't this be true in our life? A desperation to see Christ, even as a Christian. They here, these men, would be willing to get to him at all costs, whether damages to one's reputation or damage to one's house. Verse 4. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Now, let's, let's paint the picture here. Houses were a little bit different back then. Uh, not only were they smaller, but they, were, they had flat roofs. Um, and they had a stairway on the outside, typically, that would lead to the roof. And it was really a second level. It was outside, but you could, if you were tired of being in a dark, cramped house with other people, you could go outside, go up the stairway, and be refreshed on the top of your house on the roof. And so it served as a second story there, 
and there was likely there an access to that second level. It doesn't seem there was anyone up there. Everyone wanted to be with Jesus. So the men take it with the intention of getting to Jesus. This is interesting, isn't it? It's like their faith was creative. They wanted so much to get to him because they believed he could heal him. Spiritually and physically, they would do whatever they creatively could to get to Jesus. It's almost like the persistence of faith. Alexander McLaren says their faith developed a sanctified ingenuity. That is, get to Jesus in any way possible. Use creativity if needed. Figure it out. How desperate are you, even as a believer, to be with Jesus? I mean, I think it kind of humbles all of us, doesn't it, that we have access to Christ any time. Uh, we don't understand as Christians now what it's like for Jesus to be afar and to not know Him, to not have His, his presence and His attention. Kent Hughes says, Pastor Kent Hughes, there was no way they would have gone to such outrageous extremes of action if they did not implicitly believe that Christ could and would heal their friend. Some think the faith is not in the paralytic, the faith is in his four friends. And who knows, maybe the paralytic doesn't have a lot of confidence in Christ, but his friends do. Because they're going to get him to Jesus no matter what it takes. It's persistent faith. So, in one of the most famous stories of the Bible, which I don't think I can do justice to this morning, the men begin to take apart the roof. Imagine that in our own church. It would be hysterical, wouldn't it? Actually, we probably had some frustrated church members. Explain this one to the insurance company. But the paralytic is unhindered because of his faith, his confidence, his persuasion or his friend's persuasion that Jesus can forgive, that Jesus can heal, that Jesus can do anything, they continue to get to him. It would have taken some time, right, to get through that roof. Faith says, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And notice here again, going back up, it's, it had said crowds. Mark uses the word crowds 38 times in 16 chapters. Uh, it, it's a main point of his whole narrative is, is, is all of the people wanting him, pressing in, following Jesus. And it actually builds the tension often in the gospel story. And I think it, it builds tension here. You should, you should feel claustrophobic in this story. And you should feel like it might be impossible to get to Jesus because that's how many people probably felt who had something to bring to him. Again, the windows were small, the doors blocked, so they go through the roof. Galilean homes then, during the first century, were made of logs and sticks and mud, carefully put together, and then, it was, then they formed a layer of clay over the roof a hardened clay that would prevent the rain from coming through. Uh, it was very thick, and it would have taken a good shovel or whatever they had to get through that roof. And they took it apart bit by bit. Uh, bit. I like how it says they, they dug. They made an opening here, rather. And they let him down. It literally says they unroofed the roof. Um, what a process, right? Imagine the exhaustion of these four men. Let's go backwards. Let's rewind the tape. These four men are carrying these a man. These four men are carrying a man. These four men are carrying a man. Four men are carrying a man. That's a very important point. That's a very important point. That's a very important point. Do I need to mute? Oh, you good. You got it? So these four men are exhausted. I'm exhausting hearing myself already. <laughs> so Raymond was playing with Sermon the other day. I'm like, who is that? That's me. Oh, um. And they've carried them, I don't know how far, from the city into the city, uh, at Capernaum. Maybe they were outside another town. They get here, then they carry him to the roof, so they have to go upstairs with this man. And then they have to dig through the roof physically, and then they have to lower him down. That's persistent faith. Uh, maybe the paralytic was rich, and he paid these four men to do the job. Maybe they were just friends, and they were willing to do whatever to exhaust themselves to just see what Jesus might do with him, and probably sending pieces of the roof everywhere, all over the people, probably on the scribes, which would have been a 
great thing for the people to see them in their long, beautiful, flowing robes, all put together, now dirty and filthy. Uh, Probably the preacher was dirty. Maybe Jesus had stuff in his hair and his beard from the falling roof. You might call this the messy miracle. Verse 4 says, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. You can just visualize this narrative taking place. They got to Jesus. That's the point. And what happens next would both shock the people, but would frustrate and anger the scribes. And that leads us to our third point. The pronouncement is forgiveness. The pronouncement is forgiveness. Verse 5, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Wow, that's a. We're just used to hearing that, I think. That's a powerful statement. Three words Lege to paralutico. Son, your sins are forgiven. That's short and shocking. How dare he say that? And unexpected for you and I, right? Because why? What do we assume he's going to do? He's going to heal the man. But he he forgives him of his sins. Certainly not what we expect here. Maybe what the people expected, though, or, or at least what they knew needed to happen in order for him to be healed physically. So I think we're more caught off guard to some extent. The scribes, though, are certainly caught off guard by what he says. Jesus here, though, does not simply say he's in a state of forgiveness. Like, this just happens to be true about him. Jesus is actually saying he forgives him of his sins. And listen to this. The paralytic receives forgiveness, notice, without confession. There's no confession here at all. Proverbs 28.13 Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. You have to confess your sin to God to obtain mercy. Or we know 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, there's a condition there, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But again, there's no confession here. Jesus simply forgives him. I was thinking, you know, Psalm 51 is that great psalm of confession. There's Psalm 32, there's Psalm 38, but Psalm 51 is really the famous one. David said this, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. He says in Psalm 51, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, Cleanse me from my sin. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. And David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. This is certainly clear. David could do nothing about his sin. It had stained his soul. There's no way to get rid of it. But he knew God could. Only God can accomplish this. Only God can forgive sins. That was clear in the mind of the Jew. They knew their Old Testament. They knew the Psalms and the prophets. But Jesus, with three words and no delay, no praying to the Father, no waiting on an answer, He simply forgives Him. Friends, the only man in the entire universe that can forgive sins is Jesus Christ. And He can forgive your sins once and for all. So look nowhere else for the one who can blot out your transgressions, as David said. No one else can wash you thoroughly from all your iniquity. No one else can cleanse you from your sins. No one else can create in you a clean heart. No one else can. The paralytic, though, might not be able to walk, but his movement to get to Jesus likely is that confession. I think what's going on here is Jesus is demonstrating himself to be God, not only in forgiving sin, but seeing in the heart of this man. He didn't need to verbally confess his sin, although I would encourage all of us to verbally confess our sins to God. 
or quietly through prayer, nevertheless to confess them. But Jesus knows his heart. He knows where he stands. And he forgives him immediately without questioning his motives. Why are you here? He could have asked. But he does not. And he forgives him. I believe Jesus sees into his heart. And I think this is true because in the next section we're going to see Jesus knows the hearts of his enemies, the scribes, who really have no heart. Look at verse 6 with me. And now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? I'll end there for a moment. Here's the contrast. There's a contrast now between a paralytic sinner and a righteous teacher of the law a righteous scribe. The sinner moves to Jesus. The sinner does everything they can to get to Jesus. The so-called righteous do what? They sit. They do nothing. More than that, they challenge Jesus. They question Him, which is what unbelief does. Unbelief challenges Jesus. One person moves, one sits, One is unhindered, one is indifferent, one has a heart, one does not have a heart. One, though, is forgiven of their sins, and one is hardened by their sins. And these religious leaders in this passage, in in the next four sections, Mark has grouped these stories together, all involving the religious leaders. They're all going to challenge Jesus by questioning him. Every section literally has a question from the scribes. Not because they're really curious and want to know, because they don't believe in him. And eventually they will seek to destroy him. But here's their question. Who can forgive sins but God alone? You know what? They're right. That's not incorrect theology. Only God can forgive sins. Uh, Us men, we can't do that. We have no ability to do that. No authority to declare that. And if Jesus did not intend to communicate that he was God, wouldn't he say something? Wouldn't Jesus say, no, 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 you're you're mistaken. That's not what I mean when I said his sins are forgiven. I'm not claiming to be God. I'm just saying this is true for him. But Jesus doesn't do that. And this would be the moment Jesus has to do that if he truly is not God. But Jesus does not correct them. Some people say Jesus doesn't claim much to be God in the Gospels. Look right here. He doesn't correct himself. He doesn't clarify himself. Either Jesus is lying through his teeth, or he truly is God who has the authority to forgive sins. C.S. Lewis famously said once that Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. Those are your options. He's either not telling you the truth, he's either crazy in his head, Or he really is who he claims to be. If he can forgive, and hopefully that can be proven, then he's God, very God. If not, according to Deuteronomy, you do not listen to this man anymore. And that's it. So Jesus, as immediate as his forgiveness of the paralytic was without confession, challenges the religious leaders who have no place for faith in him. I think he sees their motives. Isn't that what God does in the Old Testament? He looked at David, and he didn't look at the appearance of David. He looked at the heart of David. Well, only God can do that too. And yet Jesus does this with these religious leaders. They refuse to believe that he has the authority of God himself to forgive sinners, and especially a sinner like this. Jesus is really known for not answering questions, by the way. He likes to ask a question when you ask him a question. He makes you think, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? All right, there are two things. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or rise, take up your bed and walk? Well, I think I know the answer. I think you know the answer. I think they knew the answer. 
right? It's easier to claim to be God. It's easier to say your sins are forgiven than to tell the man to get up and walk. So the preacher's been interrupted. The paralytic has been unhindered. He has finally got to Jesus. Jesus has pronounced him as forgiven. And finally, the proof is healing. Number four, the proof is healing. How does one know he's been forgiven though, right? Because anyone can claim that. It's one thing to pronounce something. It's another thing to prove it. Let me encourage you. God does not require you to have a blind faith. That's not, that's not what faith is. God gives you so much evidence to believe. In fact, Romans 1 says all the evidence is out here when you leave the building, that there is a God, a creator. But Jesus here gives the evidence that what he says is true. Powerful evidence that communicates that he truly is God and that he has the authority of God himself to forgive. Verse 10, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. How do we know Jesus is, in fact, God? How do we know this man's been forgiven? He commands the paralytic to get up and walk. He commands man to do what man cannot do. And if it doesn't work, then his entire ministry is destroyed, and that's it, end of the story. Why believe anything he has to say? But notice here, he obeys Jesus immediately and perfectly. It's again, it's another miraculous miracle. That's it. He just gets up and he walks. But I love what it says here. He, he went before them all. It's kind of like he showed off. It's kind of like he said, look at me. I kind of think he showed off to the scribes. I'm, I'm reading into the space here. I think it was a nanny nanny boo boo to the scribes. You don't believe now. You have no excuse. And he was thrilled. He was a changed man physically and spiritually. And the proof, the evidence, was in the man himself as long as he lived. He was evidence that Jesus is who he claims to be, that here he forgave his sins and he removed the effects of his sins. Jesus provides total transformation. He calls himself the Son of Man, but we know here he's also the Son of of God. And the people said, we never saw anything like this. But you know what's most amazing maybe about this miracle is the unbelief of the scribes, isn't it? Especially after the miracle itself. There's no response. They're indifferent. In fact, we're going to see they just become more angry with him and they remain in their unbelief and eventually plot to destroy him. Either you rest in Jesus or you resist Jesus. There's no middle ground. You have to make a decision when you meet the Jesus of the Gospels. Either you believe in Him or you don't. There's no neutrality. And that's the case for anyone who meets the Lord. You either believe Him to be Lord or you believe Him to be a liar. He forces you into making a decision. And even if you think you don't make a decision, you make a decision to not believe in Jesus. But here, your decision to not believe, or the scribe's decision to not believe, is not based on a lack of facts. It's quite the contrary, isn't it? There is a tremendous amount of evidence. And if you choose to disbelieve, you remain paralyzed in your sin. I think our story demonstrates this fact the real paralytics were the scribes. The paralytic, the sinner, was able to walk by faith. The scribes, the self-righteous, were unable to walk spiritually because they refused to believe in Christ. So how do we walk away from this passage? Don't disbelieve. Believe. Jesus has provided evidence for you. He can forgive all of your sins. 
And what is the truth about this in the end? The greatest of these two miracles was not that the sinner walked, but that the sinner was forgiven. That's the greatest miracle, isn't it? That God would forgive us of our sins, though He don't change our physical life. There's no greater miracle, and there's no greater gift. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank You that You meet us in the Gospels again and again. It seems we stand there in the crowd, watching the crowd, watching the paralytic, even watching You. What is Your response going to be? Lord, that You would forgive this sinner. We see ourselves laying there on the mat just like He was, uh, unable to walk, unable to do anything, the outcast of society. But Lord, we believe Your Word. Lord, if we struggle with unbelief, help our unbelief. Help us to believe that You are God, very God, that You can and will forgive us of all our sins and that that's the greatest miracle and gift. We pray in Your name. Amen. those that haven't been with us uh, the last couple weeks, this is usually when we do our offertory, so there is a place to give your offering. Uh, when you leave the church this morning, there's a box back there in the foyer. Let's all stand and conclude this morning. With-